What's up guys, this is Pete and this is 2017 and more importantly the first Carrot Poker podcast of the year and for a while in fact. Today we're going to be doing some hand review but it's a little bit different as is the flavour of the year. We're not just going to do constant hand review as we kind of, I guess I fell into the rut with um, last year. Hand review is good but we want to mix it up as well so I've got my good friend Carl here and my poker buddy with me and how's it going man? Hey, yeah, not bad, thanks. Good, and you've got some hands today that have been posted on the group that you've probably commented on as one of the moderators, right? Yeah, that's right. I just picked out a few that I thought looked interesting and popped out recently. Cool, so there's no theme or anything. We're just going to get stuck into some hand review to kick us off for the new year, but this year... Let me tell you, I've got good stuff um, planned. First of all, um, I've started working on my next book, 100 Hands. For any of you who read and enjoyed the Grinders Manual or are considering getting it, um, there'll be a follow-up as well. There'll just be 100 hand examples, random, in your face, just like the poker you know, poker actually presents you with in real life. So I guess we're continuing along that vein today by looking at some random hands. We don't get to choose themes, unfortunately, when we play poker. So we need to work on the skill of just assessing as we go. Right, Carl? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Cool. So let's kick off then with the first hand. What have you got for me today? Uh, cool. So we've got um, a, a hand at two and L on stars, mm-hmm. and uh, most of the um, interesting stuff is pre flop. To be honest. Yep. Um, so should I just run through the pre flop action? Absolutely. Yep. I've got it on screen, but I'll let you take the lead with this. Yep. Cool. Oh, okay. Um, Right, so um, it's six max, and it falls around to Hero on the button, who has King King, Pocket Kings, mm-hmm. and uh, we Min Raise on the button, yep. which uh, I think is a good strategy these days. Definitely, yeah. Do we have any reads on who's in the blinds? Is there any reason to deviate from that Min strategy? Uh, so the only read that we have is on the villain that we end up playing against, who is in the small blind. Yeah. And that is a twenty two nineteen over one hundred eighty two hands mm-hmm. with three bet stat of one one percent. Okay, so uh, probably a rag. Cool. So I mean, that in and of itself probably isn't enough reason to like three X or anything like that. But if both players had like really low three bet stats, we wouldn't be concerned about getting three bet. And therefore, if they do defend, they're more likely to call, which means that we want to increase our open size to make it more difficult or worse for them to do the calling, just as an exploitative measure. But yeah. I think like there's still a big blind who's unknown. He could be a light three better or a tight player who doesn't flat. So sticking with the men's strategy here is fine. But like even two point five xing just because a small blind doesn't three bet much would be an okay adjustment. I think right off the bat. But yeah, let's go on. Cool. Okay. Um. So one uh, really relevant factor here actually before I finish the pre flop action is that we are two hundred big blinds deep with the small blind. Yep. Um, so, uh, yeah, we may open and the small blind makes it uh, five times our open. So um, we make it four cents and he makes it 20 cents at 2NL, okay? Yep. Yeah, and uh, the big blind folds and uh, I guess this is one of our first meaningful decision points. Yeah, absolutely. So this guy's three-bet percentage is one over. How great a sample do we have here? Well, so it's 182 hands overall. That's not right. necessarily how many hands that they've had an opportunity nope. to get. So I would say it's kind of early days, really. Kind of early days, yeah. Um, so I think with these stack sizes, obviously the one to four bet kind of goes out the window a little bit because free flop caller is going to have a much um, happier time doing just that. You know, calling in position using the deep stacks to use his position across various streets to higher effect post flop. What position does is it accentuates the advantage um, or what stack size does is when it's deep it accentuates the advantage of position and makes it even more powerful and it improves implied odds with so much of our range it gives us weaker hands in our calling range that then want protection from some big hands so right away i don't know what you think but right away the strategy of not forbetting anything at all is kind of jumping out at me as like a fairly reasonable option and that's maybe bolstered even more, made even more attractive by the fact that small blind as of yet is a total net with three betting and so if we get five bet how happy are we really going to be about it? Yeah, I mean, I I, um, I did consider that. I ended up coming down on the side of four betting um, simply because I believe that Villain would end up... Like, I, I guess I don't think they, they tightened their three bet range much for the stack sizes. Because no. um, I don't think, like, the average reg is, like, super good at playing um you know deep deep pot strategy especially at 2nl where people are just sort of learning the ropes for the first time no i'd agree with that much yeah yeah and then so if they if they are three betting you know the same way they would at 100 big points mm. then 
I feel like they may also um, be calling a lot of four bets our position and, sure. and, and uh, enough to make that um, uh, a value bet as such. Yeah, I mean, I think you'll be in okay shape, certainly if you do bet Kings, if you do four bet Kings though, but the hands that he would fall to the four bet are hands that you're you're crushing pretty badly and you have a positional advantage over them. So if he does three bet fold, like ace jack or ace queen or whatever, it's kind of a shame because then you don't get to play post slot with a big range advantage and positional advantage against those hands. Um, and if you do get five bet, I think like you're kind of calling and crying calling and going from there and it's it's not great. I think a bit of pot control with kings here is not bad with these stack sizes against a 1% three better. I know it's early days, but I hear your point about um, them not tightening and you will get flatted by worse hands in a four bet pot for sure. Um, but I think you can, like if 200 big blinds do go in with just one pair as well, even in a four bet pot, I don't think you're going to be that happy about it. Aces could still be in their range. There can be hands that have outflopped you. I think if you just put in 200 bigs, even in a four bet pot, against someone who's not a known fish, like that could be kind of grasping at thin value there. So if that isn't a lucrative thing, like building the pot to do that, then I feel like you can equally get as much value by flatting here and leaving weaker hands in their range, allowing them to see bet flops and avoid the problem of the five bet. So if you make me choose, I'm going to not have a four bet range in this situation, I don't think, with these stack sizes against a nitty looking player, but against a fish, I certainly would have a four bet range and it'd be like wide, not super wide, but kind of wide and, you know, value heavy primarily what i don't like doing here is four bit bluffing anything because if you're against a reg like to have a four bit bluff range here you have to make it quite big to make a four bit bluff in any way effective and that just makes the price on four betting really really bad um given that you're going to get flattered a lot um maybe you can get around that by playing some higher playability hands with live cards like suited connectors and your four bit bluff range and things so there are options but i think the simplest way for a learner to play this spot when stacks get this deep is to just flat everything against the three bet and play post flop poker. I think that's fine. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. I, how um, how do you kind of uh, a consideration that comes up a lot is um, falling out hands that have uh, kind of good equity or or might have sure. uh, put more money in uh, pre flop and then and then folded post flop. Um, sure, but I would say on the second point, hands that would call pre flop that then fold post flop. I think that they're very likely to see bet. I don't think people just check fold in four bet pots as much as they should. So I think these hands are genuinely going to check call or see bet anyway. So I'm not overly worried about a branch where they um would have flatted me or would have would have flatted me and then folded being more common than one where they just don't see bet and give up. I don't think they're going to give up all that much if we just flat here. So I wouldn't worry too much about that one. On the other side of things, like I guess like protecting equity. How worried am I about that? Not immensely, to be honest, because while we may, against a hand like Ace Jack, right, that's probably folding to a four bet, while that hand can outflop us sometimes, we also win less against it by four betting because it can bluff like one or two streets or hit a pair that can pay us off. So I think for both those points you made there, there are counterpoints that equally balance them, if not, you know, to a greater extent and actually outweigh them. That would be my reply to that. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, I did feel pretty. Um pretty bad about the situation where we get five bet after four yeah, betting. Yeah, and it's not that common, but it's common enough, I think, that it against a 1% three bet, or what you've got to realise is that that situation where you do get five bet is way more common than it is against someone with a 9% three bet. So even if you're not sold on never four betting against a 9% three bet, or which I can understand, like, coming up with a four bet strategy there, it's fine. Um, I think here, like, I would, you know, it's close anyway. I might fly even against a 9%, but certainly against a 1%, I think that branch where you face the five bet, does come up a lot more frequently solely because they have aces a lot more frequently and aces is a hand that gets five bet and not many other hands do with these stack depths so especially against net, if he doesn't have a five bet bluffing range which is pretty likely at 2nl you might have to fold to a five bet or you might have to call and then fold the flop i mean what are you really doing if you get five bet and you flat kings against a nitty looking 2nl villain i mean you can't be that happy about it surely with these stack depths yeah yeah definitely i mean um Something you said before suggested that if um, if we fall bet and we do get a five bet, that you think calling would still be the best option out of all of those. Um, I was actually yeah. thinking the bold because it's, it's yeah. always set the aces. Okay, yeah, I mean, like, just folding to the five bet, depending how big the five bet is and whether or not you have any odds to actually mine it. If it's, like, min, you might have the odds to mine and try and flop a king and just stack aces. Um but I think there is a non zero percent chance that it is something else, like Ace King sometimes or whatever, the other two kings or some queens. Not that often at all, but maybe often enough that 
maybe you should fold to the five bet, but I certainly hate it. I certainly hate it if there's just even a fifteen percent chance you're folding to like these hands that you're crushing. Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because if there are some hands that they are uh, five bet folding, then shoving starts becoming a better option. If if it's small enough that you can mine properly, then maybe calling's a better option. Yeah, I mean, I think shoving's always terrible against a five bet because like. Sure, you make them fold some hands, but those are hands that you're annihilating anyway, and you may as well call against them and just play your hand post flop. You lose the same against aces either way. So, four bet jamming is horrific here, certainly. Um, and I think it's between four bet calling and four bet folding. You know what I would do against the four bet here. But honestly, I've not, I've not heard an argument yet. Like I take all your points, but I've not heard anything that's made me want to have a four bet range. I just think flatting pre just solves all of those problems and doesn't really cost you much of any EV in the process. I really don't think it does. Sure. I, I, I didn't do the um, uh, the maths facing a 5-bet, but I pretty much assumed that that um, SPR, even with the 200 big blind starting mm. point, um, that we just wouldn't have the, the odds to set mine. Probably um, not against most normal sizes, yeah, unless it's like an actual click back, then, you know, if you're getting paid off 100% of the time, maybe you can scrape it, I don't know. But yeah, generally, like, I guess we do kind of want to fold if we get 5-bet, but we still hate that because it's not like they always have aces guaranteed or anything. So I, I don't know. I mean, four bet folding is the best four bet line that you've suggested, certainly. But I think flatting is better. Cool. All right. Um, okay. Uh, well, in the hand, uh, Hero opted to four bet. Yep. Uh, so they made it fifty eight cents, um, just under three times the four bet sizing. Yep, that's pretty good. I think the sizing's right if you are going to have a four bet range. Yeah, yeah, and and um, and uh, the small blind uh, villain um, just flat. Okay, so that's pretty much happy news when we just get flatted here. We certainly need to discount aces like a reasonable amount, like maybe by more than half, and assume that kings are, are looking really good. But the problem, as we'll see, is that even if we do flop an over pair and aces are not in his range because he's just flatted or they're discounted, you still might struggle to go just like bet, bet, jam and throw stacks in. So if you're having to check a street anyway, you're having to slow down the growth of the pot. So why not slow it down pre-flop? That would be my final point there on pre-flop, just by looking forward a little bit into the post-flop world as well. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. You're pot controlling at some point here against non-fish, I would suggest, 200 big blinds deep. Probably. I think I'd agree with that as well. I think like even if it was like the ideal run out for for kings so uh -huh. i'd still be inclined to try and just um bet two rather than three streets because yeah. they, they do nicer sometimes i mean i think on something like deuce 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 three or something that you can probably bet three times but there's just not that many boards like that there's too many boards that do make sets for your opponent and you know if you're only getting called by a few worse hands by tripling you need there to be very few better hands in that calling down range as well so as soon as like six or nine combos of sets start appearing it becomes a lot murkier for you and um, let's face it any pocket pair um, above like eights or nines or something could or sevens even could play this way like in a four bet pot could certainly be three betting out the small blind because it's not flatting and then you know flatting because there's perceived implied odds due to stack size even though there aren't really I'd still expect two NL villains to make flats with a lot of different pocket pairs and suited hands and stuff so need to be a bit careful post flop here certainly cool um I'd probably guess that like the the core <laughs> of their range now is something like um tens through queens. Um, ace king, ace queen, mm -hmm. um, and maybe some some of the sort of stuff around that on the fringes, but it starts dropping off around there. Would you? Yeah, agree maybe with suited that? broadways as well, like king queen suited and ace jack suited and stuff like that could be in there as well. It's possible, though less likely from a one percent three better. I think you're looking at a lot of specifically ace king queens and jacks specifically. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so the flop is uh, jack of spades, nine of spades, two of diamonds. Mm -hmm. And the small blind checks. Mm -hmm. um, we've got another decision point. Um, so right. we've got our hand there. So if we see bet Jack of Spades, Nine of Spades, Two of Diamonds with King of Hearts, King of Diamonds, no backdoor draws, we're getting called by Queens, which is good. We're getting called by Jacks, which is bad. And probably Ace King and Ace Queen having flopped absolute brick, brickishness on this board are just going to be folding. So I think C betting is pretty much entirely pointless because the only argument for it would be we get three streets of value from Queens. But we don't even necessarily get that on a lot of runouts or even safe runouts. So by checking back, at least we allow the ace king and ace queen part, mainly ace king, I guess. Still eight combos, doesn't matter that we've got two kings, it's still more than a pocket pair. We allow that to bet at us on the turn, we can get value later. 
one big thing to avoid here is fearing a flush, like being like, oh, look at all the draws on Jack-9, Deuce with two spades. Like, what hands is a 1% 3-bet? A 3-betting small blind with then calling a large 4-bet that actually flop a draw there. Ace-King of spades, but that's got, like, a lot of equity against you anyway. Ace-Queen of spades, perhaps. Again, lots of equity against you anyway. It has an ace. Don't worry about flush draws here. You do not care at all to, like, bet to protect against a flush draw. That's nonsense in this situation. What you want to do is think about how the different parts of Villain's range react to a flop bet. And, you know, kind of thinking exploitatively in a vacuum here because it's a rare spot against a 2NL weaker player. Um, and so, do you want to bet or check? I think clearly you want to check and get your value a little bit later on. You're still going to get one or two streets on most runouts and you can induce bluffs. And most importantly, I guess, you can control the pot so that when Villain does have a hand like pocket jacks and whatnot, you're not necessarily always getting stacked. Yeah, I, th I think this is um, something that maybe got missed out a little bit in the discussion in the group about the hand, mm -hmm. that um, just because you, you probably can value bet the flop doesn't mean you particularly need to. Of course, can... this is a common thing. People say, I can bet for value, therefore I should bet for value, and that is a massive logical leap. Just because it's plus EV to value bet, and of course it is, doesn't make it the highest EV line or plan with your range. Cool. Yeah. Um, the other, like, I guess one other reason to bet would be uh, protection, but I, I didn't like this reason this time for um, for a couple of um, yeah for a couple of reasons. That the first is that uh, in terms of overcards to our hand, um, if we had queens, for example, um, then there would uh, potentially be two um, two overcards to our hand. Um, so we'd be folding out more equity from that point of view. Um, but with kings. But that it's literally just kind of the three outs when they've got uh, ace king and ace queen. So yeah. I thought that kind of devalued betting for protection. You, for you can't reason. even bet queens. Sorry to interrupt. Though. You can't even bet queens either, though, because if you have queens, then you're literally getting called by like nothing worse, and you can't value bet. The only reason you can value bet kings is because queens is in their range. So I think queens and kings are both checks here, but king for, for slightly different reasons. Oh yeah, of course. Actually, yeah. I guess the queens example is uh, blocking the hell out of the hand that you want to. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just tying with queens, and it's just very unlikely. I mean, villain could even have kings in that case, and then it's really bad to bet the flop. So I think queens is a clear check, because there's not that many draws you need to worry about. Yes, you can have ace-king, you are giving a free card to ace-king, but who cares? It's just six outs, and it's one street. You can bet the turn if he checks again. Um, I think with kings here, though, um, you know, betting is, is bad for a different reason, and that you don't really need to protect as much in the one hand that you can get some value from, i.e. queens. You can do that later on anyway. Um, sure, the turn could be like the Ten of Spades or something like that, but that's just the worst case scenario turn that people imagine. There are a lot of other turns in the deck that are not very harmless for us, such as the Three of Diamonds. Yeah. So what's yeah. the turn, Carl? What's that, sorry? What's the turn in this particular hand? Ah, yes. Well, um, well. Uh, first of all, here I did decide to uh, check back on the flop. Yeah, I like it. Uh, and the turn is the three of diamonds, so it's now jack of spades, nine of spades, two of diamonds, and the turn's the three of diamonds. You'd think I'd be looking at this hand or something with that psychic guess, right? <laughs> um, yeah. uh, so, um, as, as it turns out, the um, the small blind bets, uh, what's that about? Uh, just under two thirds pot, something like that? Yeah, 72 into 118, so pot size remains static, 118 from the flop to the turn. The board now reads jack of spades, nine of spades, deuce of diamonds, three of diamonds, jack nine, three deuce, double flush draw. We have the king of diamonds, by the way, so that cuts ace king of diamonds. That's not even in his range, so again, draws here are not a consideration. It's just not consistent with his range at all. And small blind bet 72 into 118. So clearly it's a call. I mean, I don't think there's anything else we can say about this. I don't think it's even worth wasting time by going explaining why raising would be ridiculous or why folding would be ridiculous, right? I think the listeners can probably probably understand that raising just isolates the times he has jacks or aces and doesn't achieve very much. And if we didn't want to value bet flop, we sure as hell don't want to raise turn, basically. And, you know, folding would be just ridiculously tight. So call, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, maybe this is a good illustration of... Um... Uh, you know, kind of, um, I don't know, I just, I think, yeah, clearly, clearly calling's best on the turn. Yeah, I think it illustrates a spot where, like, in poker, there's a tendency to, like, claim things for whatever reason. You can always find some argument for something, but here, you really can't. Like, it's one of the rare spots where it's just, like, call and move on, I think, and that should become automatic for most learning learning players. Sure, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so here I did call. Um, and the river is a bit of a blank, really, I guess. Um, the four of clubs. Yep. 
Uh, so both the draws bricked. Um, I guess some kind of rare gut shots might have got there. Uh, ace five if they flat like ace five suited. Yeah. Um, but all in all, pretty um, uh, didn't really change much to be honest. And um, the uh, villain in the small blind um, shoves mm-hmm. for uh, three dollars forty seven into two sixty two. Yeah. Uh, now they uh, they cover hero. Uh, it's still an overbet, um, but hero has um, three dollars. Okay. Uh, so effective uh, shove is three dollars eight cents to hero into a pot of two six two, and the board reads jack of spades, mm-hmm. nine of spades, deuce of diamonds, three of diamonds, four of clubs. Yeah, that's okay. the one. So what do you think? Um, well, uh, first thoughts are that it seems polarizing. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't seem like they would do this with Queens. No, I agree. I think Queens is very unlikely from this particular type of player. I think a really aggro spewy fish could have Queens here and be overvaluing or just, I have the best hands for a shove or whatever. But I think like someone with a 1% three bet, like a regular looking player, um, who's just two NL starting off ABC is just not going to have Queens here. He's going to be more timid um for the most part so yeah and also in four bet pots are you going to see a shove from like a, a hand like ace king is it really gonna like how often is it gonna lead turn and then just shove the river all in here sometimes but not that often how do you how do you approach as per the teachings of the grinders manual and the, our community how to deal with an end of action spot like this what's the first thing we do carl well one of the first things you do is you work out how much accuracy you require to make the call properly. right so if you don't know what your target is you're kind of punching around in the dark there you're not going to solve the spot so milestones pot size um shove 33 percent. right so if you shove for pot we need to be good a third of the time to break even or slightly lose after rate that's not even that positive a thing by the way um given that he's over bet slightly you're probably faster at this um exactly calculating the target than i am but i would imagine that i guess that this is somewhere around like 35 percent or something like that that we need yeah it's, it's probably something like that i mean given that we're um we're going to be comparing this to how much equity we think we have which is in itself a pretty error prone yeah. process i think just adding like three or four percent yeah. it, it doesn't really matter whether you add three and i add four you know yeah i think it is very we need to be good slightly over a third of the time is basically what it boils down to right yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. so with that aside, are we good just over a third of the time? If we look at Villain's range quite narrowly, snugly here, he's given us the luxury of being a net over 180 hands, so likely his range is something like Ace-King, um, Aces, like one one or two combos of Aces, some Ace-King, and some Pocket Jacks, right? I would say that's likely what Villain's range is here. Do you agree with yeah. me, first of all, before we go any further? Yeah, absolutely. It's just how many of those over cards they're going to have in their range. Right, okay, how many of the Ace King or whatever is there. So Jax is there for three combos worth. Whenever you have a pocket pair that hits a set, it goes down from six to three combos. In this example, we see the Jack of Spades is out on the flop, which means the only way you can make two Jacks is Diamonds and Hearts, Diamonds and Spades, Spades and Hearts. That's only three ways in my book, right? So three combos. Um, Talking about a hand like Ace King, that's eight combos. It would normally be 16, but we hold two of the Kings. So it's two Kings by four aces, which is eight. But we need to discount that massively. We'll come back to that in a second by how much. And the other part of his range is aces, but we're discounting that from preflop. Why are we doing that? Um... Well, for the uh, flying the four bit. Yeah, he flatted the four bit. He didn't want to inject the pot further in five bit pre, so probably only gets there with a couple of combos of aces. Does he even ship aces? Maybe, maybe not. So, give him like what one combo of aces here. Is that fair? Yeah, sounds good. One out of six. Yeah, I think that's reasonable due to the discounting. Three of jacks makes four combos. So, how many of ace king? Well, to call, we need to be good just over a third of the time. We've got four combos of hands that we beat. So. We need him to be, I guess, what, like one and a half combos of Ace-King or something would need to be in there for this to become like a break evenish call. Yeah, like two combos of bluffs and then it's going to be easily... It's going to be an easy call, yeah, if he bluffs Ace-King like a quarter of the time here. What yeah. do you think? I I, just, I think we should call, to be honest. I think um, we should call? Yeah, I don't know, I just... It's, it, it seems like um, you'd have to have a pretty extreme read to think that they don't have even like two bluff combos. So I just don't think we have that information. And then yep. uh, there's a whole kind of pseudo GTO side of things after that. But and then you have, speaking, could nines be in his range sometimes? Could nines three bet the small blind and then peel the four bet with this, these stacks? I think it could. I think we might be missing a trick there by not um, including nines. Yeah. Maybe yeah, a few nines, which would maybe make it the case that he needs a few more bluffs 
Um, I, th I also think that you will sometimes get really unlucky and just see some random shit like pocket threes or like ace five suited or something that's made astray. Like it's not unheard of that'll happen. But by the same token, it's not unheard of that it will just show up with like king queen off as well, like every now and then. Um, yeah. once the blue moon. I think this is one of these spots that's interesting pre flop and kind of boring on the turn. Interesting on the flop as well. Boring on the turn and like really boring on the river. Like that's how I'd assess this spot. Like why is it really boring? Because I don't really care what we do. Like that's honestly my opinion. I think that your required equity is about thirty five percent. I think you'll be good around a third of the time. Something like I think you'll lose here more than half. Like pretty comfortably actually. I do. Um. Are you going to lose two thirds of the time? Maybe, maybe not. I think it's not that important what you do here. Um, given it's 2NL and the guy's got nitty tendencies, I would actually fold. And that's because I think I've got slightly less than that target. Because this is not an unknown. This is someone who's had... How many opportunities do you get to 3-bet over 180 hands? Like, you must get, like, what, 20, 30, 40 opportunities or something to 3-bet? Yeah. Maybe not 40, but somewhere like 30 opportunities or something at least, right? And he's done it, like, one time. Or less than that. He must have had more opportunities, actually, if he's got 1%. He must have had, you know, um, upwards of, like, 50 or something, I guess. But, yeah, if he's only taken that, taken that offer up once and only three about, like, one time and all those hands, then I think it's very unlikely that he's the type of player who would shove all in as an overbet in the river with a worse hand in Kings. I would fold here for that reason. I think that we might be assuming too much that we know nothing. I think we do have very good reads here. I think that three-bet stat is pretty... Pretty reliable that not that he's got a one percent three bet that you can trust it literally, but reliable that he's a tighter player and tighter player at two NL and a four bet pot. I reckon you're going to see jacks here the majority of the time and probably enough that you should fold if you make me pick. But like I say, I think we lose most of the time. I don't think we lose like eighty percent or anything like that. Um, so it's not like an obvious fold, but I would fold. You would call probably we don't. It doesn't make an enormous difference. Yeah. So are we looking at basically being just like a? you know, 5% at most either side of the target um, based on how you yeah. feel about It's hard to say. I think as that sample gets bigger, it becomes more and more of a certainty that you're just not getting bluffed here ever because that 1% three bet is just so telling about someone's character. But the sample is not even 200 hands yet, and that's the only thing that makes me think that calling isn't horrible. I think if you had a 1,000 hands in this guy, calling would be really horrible. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Happy with that hand then? I think River's boring though because it's the type of spot people post in the forum and I'm like, oh god, here we go again. Like I'm writing a hundred hands in my book right now. It's my new book which is just, like I said, just lots of examples. And I'm going through the student forum and I'm finding templates and so many of them are, here's a ridiculously rare, weird, massive pot on the river. And there's only so much of that that people want to learn about because it happens so rarely. So what I'd say to you guys listening is that this kind of hand is cool to post and it's intriguing to know what you should have done and it'll haunt you and keep you awake at night because we're human, but it's probably not the most beneficial thing for you to obsess over or spend a lot of time on. It's boring educationally, even if it's exciting monetarily because it's a 400 big blind pot. Yeah, I think um, I think people in the study group that have got a really good focus because in, in the discussion thread for this hand, uh, the river was basically just not discussed. Like no one was really Love it. In it. Love it. Yeah, but that's exactly the way yeah. it should be. You should post this hand and you should get loads of comments about your pre-flop and flop play. Then you should be you should deserve to feel stunned at why no one called like pulled you up on the river or why no one talked about the river. Because if you've just posted this thinking about what you should do in the river, and I've not seen this thread, right? So I don't even know who this is by or whatever. So I'm in no way like personally um, attacking anyone. But if you've just posted this and your question is just like, what do I do in the river? You have missed the whole point of this hand. That's a really eye-opening thing that I think the, that everyone listening should understand. Yeah, definitely. I mean, no, both the, both the person who posted the hand and all the discussion afterwards, it was... Uh, targeted a lot at the um, pre-flop and flop decisions, Good which stuff. Uh, yeah, the most instructive. To be and that's why we have a thriving community because people know what they need to look at to get better, and that's so important in a poker community. If you guys want to join us, feel free. Um, you can shoot me an email, and I can tell you how to sign up um, for a small fee. Or if you hire me for coaching, then hey, it's included. It's free. You get to join us, us guys, and work with us. Um, and we're doing loads of cool stuff in the community right now, aren't we, Carl? We're planning a poker uh, training weekend away somewhere in the countryside or whatever. So that should be cool. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. Come join the fun. It's yeah, absolutely. Hang out at a house, a rural house, order some takeaway from the one Chinese in the nearby village and discuss poker and drink beer, you know.
pay pay a little fee to go and there'll be an awesome weekend where you learn a lot hopefully as well but you gotta be part of the community before we can trust you to show up at our country manor so yeah go ahead <laughs> sign up with us come join the fun right next hand we'll do one more then we'll wrap up cool okay um so the next hand is uh, is actually kind of a, a comedy hand um it's been posted uh i mean we, we can talk about the strategy of it but it's been posted generally just for a uh, look how bad villains play was here cool um, so how bad like, are the how bad are villains at what is this 5nl zoom right so at 5nl zoom how important is it that we remember that people suck i think it's pretty important yeah yeah definitely yeah, I mean, it comes up in a lot of decisions yeah just that they can do really really bad stuff if they're an unknown and you're playing low stakes like 5 10 nl whatever there's every chance that they're just a moron and they're just going to show up with some absurd thing that you know like no decent reg would ever do just bear that in mind yeah i mean if you're, if you're doing your job properly you know specifically in which ways that they're, they're bad as well absolutely uh, yeah it's not enough just to be like they're all idiots like who cares you want to say, well, in what ways are they are they playing badly? Like, how can their mistakes be quantified in a way that actually, in a sorting kind of way that actually helps me out forming default strategies, right? That's important, absolutely. Yeah, cool. Okay, uh, so the hand then. Let's um, go, yep. Let's go, yeah. Uh, six max again, five and L this time. And uh, it falls around to hero in the cutoff. And we're 100 big blinds deep this time. And uh, hero has 8-8, eight, eight, we'll get eight. And they open uh, two and a half x. Uh, the button folds. Uh, small blind uh, three bets, but quite small mm -hmm. to uh, five point eight big blinds. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, really small. And what and, does that say um, about player type? Just before we go any further, well, it's probably not a reg. Probably not a reg. Probably a bad player. So we can expect a high randomness factor and try to put more combos of random shit in villains reigns that we wouldn't if we knew he was to be trusted. Basically, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, big line folds and uh, hero calls. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to discuss that decision point or do you just want to kind of... Um, I think, like, calling with 100 BB stacks. Are we 100 BBs? No, villain has 73.2 big blinds. Um, it's still fine because your pot odds are so great. You're in possession against a bad player. Your implied odds are semi-reasonable despite the slightly shallower stack. So eights is just a no-brainer call. I mean, yeah, that's good. Okay. I mean, if um, small blind sizing was higher, but their stack size was still about 75, roughly. Um, um, you could fold, probably, to a random fish's three bet um, if they're a bit shorter and they make it, like, big here, like nine or something. If they make it, like, seven and a half, I'd probably call um, somewhere around there. 5.8 is just a no-brainer call. Okay, that's interesting. Um, okay, yeah, uh, so on the flop, uh, the flop is 10, 8, 3, rainbow. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And the small blind checks, so they forego C betting. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's on here. Um, pretty straightforward bet. Yeah, I mean, what's the pot size here? 12.6. The three bet's been small enough pre that you need to bet three times now to get all the money in against some ace king hand that's going to call you down or whatever. So, not betting here is criminal. Like you've got to start building this pot. Slow playing here. Resist that temptation for you newer guys who have a temptation here. Like, I've flopped a set. I'm terrified of him folding, I need to check. Like, we as humans, we get terrified of a thing we really don't want to happen. Ben poker, you need to remember that it will happen sometimes regardless of what you do. You may just make no money here. And not betting will not make you extra, much extra money those times, whereas not betting when you are getting paid off three times will cost you a shitload. That's the key. I think sizing is probably an interesting question, though, because yes. uh, on the flop, the pot size is um, like 12 and a half big blinds. Yeah. And effective um, stacks are about 67 or something. Yeah, Hero ends up betting 75% pop. So, so we I bet think we can probably bet smaller. Yeah, we bet 9, making the pot 30 on the turn, leaving around 60 left, 2 to 1. Yeah, you don't need to apply that much pressure. Like, bet like half pot here, and you're comfortably setting up three streets against villain stack. Give him reason to call with ace jack or call with king queen or off or whatever you're crushing everything he has almost no equity against you with his range why blow him out of the pot with a hand that could turn top pair and then give you a stack or just pay off multiple streets or just pay off one street instead of zero streets this is a big mistake betting nine into 12 here i'd go as far to say you want to bet smaller yeah i mean it, it doesn't really have any downsides on the latest streets but it probably just gets many more calls on the flop would you say absolutely and i mean it has actual upsides on the later streets and that you've built a pot that allows you to get stacks in um, either way 
but you've made more hands get there and the upsides it has are just phenomenal you know like getting two over cards to continue so it gets a chance to flop top pair that will stack off that's huge it's like yeah. slow playing there's arguments for slow playing which are along those lines but that costs you too much so the balance is just to bet a reasonable size that still allows you to get stacks in don't let the pot stay stagnant that's a disaster but don't like smash it either okay um so just just to compare the situation then so say we have jacks mm -hmm. um and for some reason we chose not to full bet it pretty which mm -hmm. could be quite reasonable anyway um anyway we've got jacks on 10 a3 mm -hmm. uh in terms of sizing um obviously we're not like crushing it that much anymore uh would you increase sizing there um i think with jacks you could add a little bit to your sizing yeah but you do still want villain to call you with two over cards when if you size big enough you just don't want him to call you if you size like one quarter pot because then he's correct to call you so it's not that you want to force him to fold two overs at all costs like with a hand like jacks you do still want to bet and you do still want to bet kind of small but i don't know if you make me choose i might bet like six with eights and like 750 with jacks or something but it wouldn't be like a, i would never bet three quarters pot here with anything yeah I mean, we've, we've got a luxury of changing our bet sizing against this player type anyway don't we so, yeah yeah so we don't need to be consistent with our bet sizing here no way yeah cool all right um okay uh so hero did bet uh nine big blinds into 12 and a half yep. and the blind called so mm -hmm. they ended up check calling the flop uh the turn is a queen um and it's still a rainbow board uh, so, so it's, it's 10 8 3 queen on the turn yep so and, uh, if, should anyone be worried about villain having made a straight uh well no uh to be honest um i guess it's it is, it's still possible, but it's just such an insignificant part of their range. Anything's yeah, possible in poker, that's the thing. But it's so insignificant, so unlikely that we just disregard him having Jack-9 here. Who cares? So, yeah, still going for value. Queens has improved. That's a bit of a bummer, but Queens is quite likely to bet the flop, so I'm not, like, overly alarmed. You know, it's still a case of let's get the money in, right? Let's slam the turn, but not overly hard. Let's set up the river shove. Let's keep betting. I think it's quite simple. Again, if you take a free card, if you give Villain a free card on the turn... Well, now we can have gut shots and stuff as well to get a free card. And you've just missed your chance to shove the river. You've just missed your chance to get stacks in. So giving one free card has exponentially bad effects for the next street. Like I talk about in Drowner's Manual, the exponential mistake, um, which is discussed at great length there. So bet the turn, right? Nothing much else to say. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, we ended up uh, betting 22 big blinds into 30 and a half on yep. this street. Yeah, maybe uh, a tad big again if you want to just keep Villain continuing with loads of junk like Ace King. Um, you want him to call Ace King again, maybe take a bit off that and entice him to maybe bet like, I don't know, 20, 20 or like 18 or something. Still setting up comfortable river shove for just over half pot if you bet like 19 here or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So I'd uh, say his hero sizing is a bit big on flop and turn, but um, that's something he can work on is definitely bet sizing on this hand. I know it's posted to say how bad is villain, but I'd also like to say, you know, well, your sizing isn't all that impressive either, so just focus down on sizing in the near future. Um, yeah, that sounds like such a dick move. Like, you're trying to mock villain, but you're actually the fish for your sizing. I don't really mean that, but, like, it's the point is in any hand, even if it's an entertaining hand, that you can always nitpick mistakes as a coach, especially I can, because I like nitpicking mistakes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes um, I, I've had this as well, where, like, villain's play is so atrocious that you just feel the need to tell someone just because yeah. you've <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's almost like to keep your sanity. It's like in life, if someone did something really weird to you one day, you'd have to tell everyone, right, just to, like, get some reinforcement that that's really insane. So in poker, I think we have that same instinct, yeah, but always, always look for educational things in any hand that you go through the effort of posting, for sure. Yeah, cool. Okay, um, so the small blind uh, ended up check calling the turn. Yeah. Um, and the river, um, hero's got forty. Oh no, sorry. Um, effective with small blind. There's thirty six left behind into okay. seventy four. So slightly uh, under half pot left. Okay. Yeah, that's it. And uh, it's another queen uh, on the uh, on the river. So the run out was ten eight three queen queen uh -huh. and uh, small blind checks again. Okay, uh, so we obviously automatically stick the rest in. Not much to say there. We've still got the nuts, basically. Yeah. And that's a great card for us. Why is that queen, like, a phenomenal card? Uh, well, I mean, it's um, 
uh, it's going to mean that hands like Ace Queen and King Queen, if those were stubborn enough to try to call the flop, yep. um, are almost certainly going to call again now. So. Let me just hark on one more time. King Queen might have folded the flop due to your sizing being too big. Not you, Carl, but the student. So if the student sizes correctly on the flop, then maybe you get called um, on the turn on, and on the river and you make like loads of extra bets. Right, I can hear dog movement downstairs. My dogs are starting to go berserk. So before they start barking, we should probably wrap this podcast up. What did Villain have? Uh, so, um, well, yeah, Hero shoved and Small Blind Check called the third street and they had Ace 3, I believe. Ace uh, 3. Yes. So, Ace 3, so they had bottom pair. Um, wow, so they've check called the flop. Um, well, first of all, they've they've made a small 3-bet pre, which is really weird with Ace 3. Then they've check called the flop, turn and river with a pair of threes in this three bet pot nice so it does go to show that sometimes you get a lot of really nice gifts from your fishy um population which is which is always nice to hear um never lose faith the population will always do things far worse than you could ever anticipate and i've seen a lot worse than this in my days and i'm sure you have as well carl yeah villain villain purse on a uh, ice king maybe. Yeah, that's why fish think, right? He has his king, or he has the flush draw. It's like the two hands you can have in the mind of a, of a fish. There are no other hands in the limit holder. Ace king and flush draws forever. Yeah, and there, there are no flush draws in this hand. Ergo, we must have ace king. Yes, exactly. If there are no flush draws, it has to be ace king. Usually it's ace king with a flush draw. That's what people have almost always, then you know that. There's only four <laughs> combos of ace king suited, but when the two come together, it's like some kind of chaos theory. You just all, He always has it. He has ace king with that flush draw. Um, which is good. I mean, it shows that people don't really put you on a range. They put you on one hand. They try to be heroes. They try to soul read. Um, and it just ends up benefiting us. So, right. I'm, we're going to wrap up for today. Thank you very much for coming on the show. I'm still taking on students if you guys are interested. And I'm going to leave you guys, listeners, with the sound of annoying dogs. And see you on the next episode. Thanks for coming on the show, buddy. Appreciate it. And let's do it again soon.